You're listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Hi, Courtney. How's it going? Yeah, it's going really good. I can't believe that only two days ago we were together. Like my jet lag is maybe not great. I think my brain is like functioning at 60% right now, but otherwise it's good. How are you guys doing over there in New York? Uh, I'm okay. It is a super busy, busy time of the year. And um, yeah, I can't believe we were together in DC. It was so much fun to actually physically be in the same space together. And then all of that advocacy work is just, yeah, it's super inspiring. I think it was a really good way to launch us into this episode today because we talked so much about asthma while we were there. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it was really interesting to just hear from the different patients that they brought in and all of the asthma disparities. And yeah, asthma is just such an important topic. And, you know, we've been talking about how it's affected my life. The fact that my mom died in the 90s from an asthma attack and I have asthma and now I'm treating patients on a daily basis with asthma. It's just yeah, asthma is a big part of my life, actually. So um, I'm excited to start talking about this and just sharing all the information that we have. Yeah, I know you are quite the asthma advocate. I mean, you also represent the Lung Association because we've seen you on TV talking about asthma and quality of air. And I know that in April, you climbed 55 stairs to help raise awareness. And then, yeah, D.C., of course, where we were advocating. Yeah, it's pretty clear that asthma is something you want to draw greater awareness to. Yeah. I mean, I decided to take a more active role with advocacy last year when I had a friend uh, pass away from an asthma attack. And that's really when I started to become more involved with the American Lung Association, just because I realized that the disparities in asthma really, really, really still impact this country in a big way. And so I wanted to work with an organization that was helping with spreading the message about lung disease and how much people need to be aware about how serious these diseases can be. And so, you know, just making sure that people are getting the help that they need in a timely manner, I guess. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more about that because last year, you know, last year in D.C., I had my eyes opened like it was insane. And I agree that I felt like I had controlled asthma. I have asthma, everyone, if you didn't, didn't know yet. Um, anyhow, and I realized that it was not controlled. And when I thought that I was, you know, someone who knew what they were doing to finding out that I was potentially in danger, you know, by not having controlled asthma, I wanted to help spread the word as well, because it is a scary disease. And I know that it is a huge disease to talk about. So from what I understand today, we're going to do one of three parts because we have to break this down into a three-part series since there's so much to cover and we're not even taking that deep of a dive because that's how big asthma is. Yeah, yeah. Asthma is a huge topic and, you know, we've outlined it as three series. It might even end up being like 10 series, but we'll kind of just see how things go. And, and you know, just in the last 25 plus years, we have learned so much more about the disease and the treatments have gotten more advanced because of our knowledge. So it's just super exciting to see all the research. And in fact, I'm writing an article right now with one of my interns on the history of asthma. And it's super interesting just to see how our knowledge of the disease has led to so many advances. Um, So today we'll try to cover as much as we can about asthma, but we'll save the types of asthma, the severity of asthma and the treatments for the other two parts of the series. So today we'll really just go over the symptoms, triggers, and how we diagnose asthma. Great. So let's jump in. Um, When I think of asthma, I think of wheezing, coughing, and chest tightness. But I'm sure that there's a more scientific way of defining it. So why don't we start by defining it? Could you do that for us, please? Sure. So you're absolutely right. Wheezing, coughing, and chest tightness are the symptoms that you get when you have asthma. And then what's happening inside of your body to cause the symptoms, I actually like to look at in two basic ways. But first, I think we should talk about the lungs and how they function. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, so we get a better foundation of what we're talking about. Okay, cool. Yeah, exactly. I think it's always good to start with an understanding about how the lungs function. And so essentially, 
I'm going to start is when you take a deep breath through your mouth and nose and the air that you take in goes into a tube called the trachea. And then the trachea branches off like a tree. And the first branches are called the bronchi. And then they branch off into multiple other tubes. And the smallest are called bronchioles. And these tubes essentially carry that air to these microscopic air spaces called alveoli. And in the alveoli, that's where we exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide. So essentially, the job of the lungs is to help get oxygen in your body and get rid of a chemical called carbon dioxide that's made from our body and needs to be discarded. So when we have asthma or any other lung disease, we can't do this as well. And that's not good because every cell in our body obviously needs oxygen to function. And if we have higher carbon dioxide levels, then that can cause harm to our bodies. Yeah, I remember that from high school biology. Does that carbon dioxide buildup play a role in asthma? Well, during severe asthma attacks, it does. And when we have higher levels of carbon dioxide in our body, it's called hypercapnia. And the carbon dioxide levels can go up when people can't kind of regulate the way that the air is going in and out. And it can lead to a lot of symptoms, including confusion and even seizures. But again, in asthmatics, this would only really help with really poorly controlled asthma and during severe at- attacks. We see this more in another condition called COPD or chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay, so hypercapnia isn't something we have to worry about too much, but it's another reason why we need to have really good controlled asthma. Now that we have a better idea of the lungs, how are the airways affected in asthma? So around those breathing tubes that we just talked about, we actually have these muscles that are wrapped around them. And the first thing that can go wrong in asthma is that the muscles in your airways are more irritable or what we call hyper-responsive, and they tighten up really easily when you encounter a trigger. So then the second issue in asthma is the inflammation of the airways. So inflammation is swelling that occurs inside of a person's breathing tubes if they have asthma. And the swollen tissues also produce more mucus, which plugs up the breathing tubes. And when you have this muscle tightening and or swelling, the breathing tubes are just plugged up and the air can't get in, which means oxygen can't get into our lungs. And it leads to symptoms of the wheezing, chest tightness, coughing, and the breathlessness because that's our body's response to not being able to get the oxygen in and to all of that mucus and inflammation. And to clarify, the breathing tubes that we're talking about are all the parts of the lung system from the trachea to the bronchioles. Yep. We're talking about the trachea, the bronchi, and all those little branches or the bronchioles when we talk about the airways. That's really interesting because I, when I was younger, I used to use this thing where I would tell people, oh, you know, asthma is like as if you were breathing through a little straw, like a chewed up straw almost. So it's like I took that feeling and that's exactly what's happening is it's if a straw is being compressed. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And a lot of, actually, a lot of people use that when they're talking about asthma and they're teaching kids about asthma. So, super interesting that you came up with that on your own. (laughs) Maybe I thought I came up with it, but my doctor actually told me. And then I was just like, took total ownership over that idea. (laughs) Sounds like a kid thing to do. (laughs) Yeah. Now that we have an idea of the system that we're talking about, what are the different symptoms and triggers of asthma? Well, we already mentioned the classic symptoms of wheezing, chest tightness, coughing, and breathlessness that's associated with asthma. And people with asthma can actually experience one of these symptoms or all of them at the same time. So it really just depends on the person. So Courtney, which symptoms do you usually experience when you have an asthma attack? Well, I usually experience coughing. That's kind of how it starts. And then there's tightness of my chest and back, definitely breathlessness, wheezing, and then it's kind of my voice gets really tight. So I have a really constricted sounding voice. Uh, And those happen when I'm exposed to environmental allergens like pollen. So during this time of the year, or especially around dogs and cats. Uh, But it also happens around smoke, either cigarette smoke or even campfires will do it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think I react in all of those scenarios too, minus the dogs. I'm not allergic to dogs. So, but when I was younger, actually my asthma was more severe and was frequently triggered by seasonal allergies and exercise actually. But as I've gotten older, my asthma has gotten better. And now I'll really only have symptoms with severe allergen exposure and heavy exercise. But yeah, but I react basically 
relate to those same things. So would the 55 stories you climbed in April be heavy exercise? Oh, yeah, right. So, I mean, I actually went pretty slow that day because right before I started climbing, I realized I might have forgotten my asthma inhaler, which worried me obviously a lot. And so I decided to go slower than I normally would have because my husband was all about like beating a record and getting up as fast as he could. And he had all these like ideas of how he was going to beat like everyone. But I was kind of like, you know what? I might not even have my asthma inhaler, so I better take things slow. So that brings up a huge point, which is the first rule in asthma is that no matter what, you have to have your inhaler with you at all times. And um, thankfully, I actually did realize that I'm smarter than I think I am. And my inhaler was in my makeup bag, which is where it usually is. But for some reason, I just wasn't sure that day. Yeah, I find it easiest to have my inhaler in a place I'll definitely remember to check before leaving the house. So like, with my wallet or my keys. But of course, I also carry an epinephrine auto injector. So I will never leave the house without that. So they're always together. Anyhow, I digress. Should we jump back to asthma? Yeah, no. But I mean, I think it's a super important point to keep making is to figure out a good system on carrying all of your meds. It's really critical to managing any condition. And actually, there's a lot of studies that show people don't always carry their medications um, like inhalers and epi. So we really need to, I think it's a super important point to keep bringing home is that we really need to make sure that we're carrying those things around with us. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, like allergies, asthma can pop up at any time or even more scary is you don't know if you're going to encounter one of your environmental triggers because it's not something you can control. So it's not like food where you just don't eat it. You definitely need to have your inhaler with you. You're right. We really can't say that enough. Yep. I totally agree. And getting back to asthma. So there's a lot of triggers that we have that we've already mentioned. And it's also super important to remember, like we already talked about, that they vary from person to person. But common triggers um, include like exercise, infection, like viruses when someone has a cold, cold weather or heat can be a trigger or with certain irritants, like you mentioned, smoke exposure or environmental and even food allergens. And then lastly, another one that sometimes confuses people is emotional stress or anxiety. This can also be a trigger for asthma. Whoa, I didn't realize that like stress and anxiety could trigger asthma. Yep. It's a really important one to remember. And underlying stress and anxiety, actually, we've seen in medicine can worsen a lot of conditions and asthma is definitely one of them. And so I also wanted to emphasize one other thing that I mentioned is that food allergies can induce asthma. And so a lot of times we see that people will have only asthma symptoms initially to a food allergen and there can be a delay in using the EpiPen because people don't realize that it's an asthma attack triggered by a food allergen. And so they start treating it as an asthma attack that they would have to an environmental exposure with, you know, using their inhaler, but that's not enough when it's a trigger, when it's triggered by a food allergen, because that kind of inflammation that's caused by a food allergen can only really be relieved by the use of epinephrine. And that's the only way that you can stop the reaction from happening and that inflammation from getting super, super bad quickly. That's really freaky to hear that you there are times where you can't differentiate whether it's an asthma attack or an allergic reaction. Is there a way that you can try to differentiate whether it is an allergic reaction versus versus an asthma attack or um, how you determine when you should use epinephrine? Right. So, I mean, the tricky thing is, is exactly what you kind of just said. I want to go into that a little bit. So allergic reaction versus an asthma attack. So again, an asthma attack can be triggered by that allergic reaction. So they're actually simultaneously happening. It does get tricky. And because sometimes the hives and swelling of the face don't happen initially, and the allergen is just affecting the airways, that's when it gets tricky. And so in situations where an asthma attack comes out of nowhere, for example, it's important to think about what just happened. Did the person just eat something that could have been cross-contaminated? Is the allergen actually being cooked in the home like shellfish or fish? And so, and if that's a possibility, using the epinephrine device that you have and is something being cooked or anything around the house, like I said. So just really looking at what's going on when those symptoms start. 
strategy that they should be reaching for their EpiPen. But we really need to look at the surrounding situation and think about what just happened was, you know, did the person just eat something and then symptoms started really quickly after that? Yeah, that's a really good point to emphasize because I think that can freak a lot of people out. I mean, that would definitely, definitely freaks me out a little bit because I have asthma and allergies. But to know your asthma triggers and what you said about an asthma attack kind of coming out of nowhere and about your like situation. So maybe an asthma attack comes out of nowhere, but you're sitting at the table or you've just eaten something and you get exercise induced asthma normally. So differentiating what goes on. I think that when someone is having an asthma attack who has allergies, they're pretty tuned in. But again, it's like knowing your triggers for both because really no, there is no fine blueprint for anything in this world. It's just about being aware of your surroundings. Yeah. And and the whole thing also is that the other thing that I'd like to emphasize is that if your asthma medications aren't working and it seems really odd that you're not getting any relief or your child isn't getting any relief from the medications you're using, that's another uh, indication that you really need to think about what might have happened and was it a food trigger and do you need to use your epinephrine device. And then, you know, as we mentioned, it's important to remember that not every episode will look the same, even for the same person. It really depends on the episode and how much muscle tightening you have and also how inflamed your airways are before you even have the attack. And we'll talk a lot about the inflammation later, but this is key. This is a key part in managing asthma is really knowing how much inflammation someone has and making sure that we're treating that inflammation actively or preventing it from occurring. I want to jump into talking about the triggers, but you just said something that I want to ask. What would be the time period they should look at? So if they've taken their inhaler and there hasn't been a change and we're trying to differentiate whether it's an asthma attack or an allergic reaction, how long should an inhaler start working? It usually starts, I mean, you've, you've had experience with your inhaler. It really starts working pretty quickly where you get some relief, you know, from the symptoms. It's just if the asthma attack progressively keeps getting worse and you're using the medications and nothing seems to be changing, then you need to ask questions, you know, especially if you're somebody else is taking care of your child that isn't familiar, you just have to question them. Like, it, did you give them anything to eat? Has they, have they eaten recently? Like what, you know, what did you give them? Check the ingredients, make sure, you know, all those kind of things. So just, yeah, you just really have to be aware of what's happened around that attack. Okay. I think we'll probably get more into this in another episode where we talk about an asthma action plan. So I will keep us moving forward. Why don't we talk about how people can find out about their asthma triggers. So is there a way that they can figure out what they are? Yeah. So, I mean, as we talked about knowing someone's history and thinking about the scenarios in which someone has an attack is super important. So in your case, you notice that asthma symptoms happen around animals and I have the same issue. And when I got tested, I was confirmed to have an allergy to cats. So Testing for allergies can definitely help people figure out some of the possible triggers that they can have. Um, And sometimes when you live with a pet, I think people don't want to admit that that pet might be causing issues. So getting tested sometimes can just help kind of differentiate what's going on. And if you have asthma symptoms with foods and also other symptoms that are associated with food allergies like hives, then getting tested for food allergies would make sense. And then we also talked about emotional and temperature triggers, which someone can figure out over time by keeping a diary of their symptoms and what factors are present every time they have symptoms. And lastly, sometimes there isn't a specific trigger and it's just caused by internal inflammation because of our overproduction of certain inflammatory cells in some people. And we're going to be talking about that more when we're talking about the different types of asthma. But, you know, we just, we've noticed that there's certain cells that can get overproduced and we need to block these cells from being produced by using different medications. So again, we'll talk about that when we talk about the different types of medica- of, of asthma. It sounds like there's a lot of different factors at play. How How do you actually go about diagnosing asthma? So we use history and testing to see if you have asthma. So one test that we do to look for asthma is a test that measures what we call lung function. It's called spirometry or pulmonary function testing, and it essentially measures how well, how well and fast you can exhale. So it helps us look at the inside of your airways and see how much inflammation might already be present. 
So one thing to remember about this test though, is that it's super dependent on your effort and how well you understand the instructions on how you're doing the test. So it's really important to try as hard as you can when you're performing this test. That makes sense. And is that why you do the test three times? So, yep, that's exactly why. We look at the best out of three or more. That's really just to get the best information we can about your lungs. And so when we do this test, we are looking at a at a lot of numbers, but one of the numbers that we look at in particular for asthma is a number called FEV1. So you might hear this term when you see your doctor. It's basically a number that looks at how fast you can blow the air out in one second. So, you know, you take a deep breath out and then we ask you to blow really hard and, or when you blow out like that, it tells us that number, FEV1. And we know that this number is really important to show how much constriction might be present in your breathing tubes or airways. And that can be for so many different reasons. And we're just going to focus on what it means for asthma. So if this number is low, then you might have a lot of inflammation or tightening of your airways. So it should be 80% or above. And that number is based on other people who are the same age, weight, height, sex, and ethnicity as you are. So we have specific goals for this number based on all of those parameters. So when we say 80%, that means that you're at 80% of where other people are that are your same age, your same height, weight, sex, and ethnicity. So if you were diagnosing asthma, say I was 70%, would that mean then I have asthma? No, good question. So it's just a marker for how much constriction is in the airways, but the FEV1 can actually be low in a lot of lung diseases. And the key thing in asthma is the reversibility component. So what that means is that when we have a low number, we then do what we call a post test. We have you use albuterol and then we wait for about 10 minutes and we repeat the spirometry test to see if that number goes up. So if the FEV1 goes up. So to make the official diagnosis of asthma, technically the FEV1 should increase by 12% or more after using the albuterol. And that shows that you have some reversibility in your airways that responds to albuterol. And that's really a hallmark of asthma. Just to clarify, in an FEV1 test, you're actually looking at two numbers and it's the difference between those two numbers that would be the diagnosis for asthma. Yes. So let's say your initial FEV1 was 70. And then after using the albuterol, your number jumped to 90%. That's a change of 20%. And that shows that you responded to albuterol and that we can open up your airways with that medication. And can you explain what albuterol is? Yeah. So albuterol is a medication that we call a bronchodilator. It's used to relax the muscles that we talked about earlier that are wrapped around the airways. And those muscles, remember, can get tightened when we have asthma. And so this is what we call our quick relief medication because it works really quickly to help relieve that shortness of breath by loosening those muscles and relaxing those muscles and opening the airways. And so remember, albuterol doesn't do anything for the inflammation that can be present in the airways with asthma. And so if your number still doesn't go up to that 80% or more, then that means that there might still be something else going on. And that can be that inflammation factor. So for example, for me right now, since my asthma is super well controlled, my number would likely be 80% or higher. And it might not change too much after albuterol because I don't have any of that muscle tightening going on because my asthma is super controlled. So if someone tested me in the middle of an attack, then you would see that my numbers are low and that I would have a change after albuterol. That's really why we also use challenge tests sometimes with asthma. So to diagnose asthma, there's something called an exercise challenge or a methacholine challenge testing. And with exercise challenge, you would get on a treadmill And then we would test you before and after to see if exercise induced your symptoms and caused your lung function to drop, which would indicate asthma. And with the methacholine challenge, methacholine is a substance that when it's inhaled, it causes the airways to spasm and narrow if asthma is present. So during this test, you inhale an increasing amount of methacholine mist before and after spirometry. The methacholine test is considered positive, meaning asthma is present if the lung function drops by at least 20%. And so, and then a bronchodilator like the albuterol is always given at the end of the test to reverse the effects of the methacholine. Those are two really interesting tests. I've never had either of them done. I've just 
had my doctor actually listen to my lungs and then I've done spirometry testing before. Are those typical methods used on all patients? No, actually, exercise and methylcholine challenges aren't done that often, and it's not needed. If we see a change of 12% in that FEV1, or if we clinically see an improvement with the use of albuterol when you're symptomatic, then you don't need to do the methylcholine challenge or the exercise challenge testing. Methylcholine testing is really just used when the diagnosis doesn't seem clear, and we want to make sure that we're really dealing with asthma. So we don't normally do the methylcholine, and also we don't normally do the methylcholine challenge in in children. Additionally, with spirometry testing, we don't do this test with younger children because as I mentioned before, it is a difficult test to perform and the technique is so important and kids can't do it. So, you know, we will start doing it around the age of six just to get kids used to it so that they understand the technique and they just keep getting better and better at it. But the numbers might not be very accurate and they might not help us very much because it's just hard for children to understand exactly what they need to be doing to make it accurate. So the diagnosis in children is dependent on history. So if a child has issues with the wheezing, coughing, chest tightness, and they respond to albuterol treatment, and it's a recurrent issue that keeps responding to albuterol, then we know that the child is behaving like an asthmatic and should be treated like an asthmatic. I really like personally being upfront about the thoughts of a child possibly having asthma so that parents know what is going on and what's most likely happening. I think we talked about that with Emma a little bit. Yeah, we talked about that with Emma and how with children, you can't technically diagnose them with asthma before a certain age, which must feel so confusing to parents and caregivers when it looks like asthma and it, you know, they feel better after albuterol, but you can't call it asthma. Yeah, exactly. And at least that's what I found in my experience. It's If you wait to call it asthma, then everyone around the child gets confused and it makes it more likely that the proper medications won't be used if they're having issues with their breathing. So Emma was discussing how it was difficult to get the school that she had her boys in to understand that her son needed albuterol when there wasn't a clear diagnosis of asthma. But really, if he's responding to albuterol, when he's symptomatic and these episodes occur frequently, then it essentially is asthma. Again, you know, this topic is difficult because a lot of physicians have a lot of different opinions on this. Just in my opinion, it's nicer to give it an actual term so that people that are taking care of your child and are around your child understand or are just more comfortable using the medications. Yeah, we talk about this in episode four with Emma. So if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about that and the struggles that Emma had around not having a proper diagnosis of asthma because her son's just too young, um, give episode four a listen. Now, are there any other tests that you would use in diagnosing asthma? So, yeah, there is another test, but it's not necessarily used in asthma diagnosis, but it's called a pheno test or uh, exhaled nitric oxide testing. And that test we used basically to monitor asthma. And it's, it is a marker for how much inflammation is present in the airways. So this test is, again, usually used just to monitor asthma. And I think all you really need to know about it is that a higher number means that you might have more inflammation in your airways. So as opposed to the FEV1, where we want the number to be high, in this test, we don't want the number to be high. And we usually, as physicians, we use this number to monitor, are you using the medications and are they working to help with that inflammation? How often do you do this test? So you would do this every time your patient comes to the office? So, right. So with spirometry or with the exhaled nitric oxide testing, it really depends on your doctor and how frequently they would do the test and how frequently you're seeing them. So in my office, I do the test on stable asthmatic patients at least once a year just to monitor their lung function and just to keep a check on their um, their numbers. But I do it more often if I change a medication or want to see how the lungs are responding to medications. That's good to note. I'll make sure that I do a spirometry test at my next appointment since it'll be about a year that I've been on a new controller and I'm curious to see you know if there's changes. I think that we will end there today because we have covered a lot and I know that we've really only scratched a tiny part of the surface because as we said, asthma is a massive topic. 
Our next episode will continue with asthma and we'll go deeper into the severity and the types of asthma, which from I learned in DC and what I've been learning is that this is really interesting to know what type of asthma you have because that plays a really important role in finding the right treatment for you. Yep. It's a really big topic and it's exactly right. We've discovered so many different elements to asthma. We know that there's different types. So knowing which type of asthma you have and finding the right treatment is super important, especially in those severe asthmatics. So yeah, so again, we've only touched the surface. And if there's things that you've heard at your doctor's visit that we didn't cover in today's episode, just remember that you can always message us, you can email us, you can direct message us on Instagram, you can message us on Facebook. Book. We have so many different platforms. We want to hear from you if there's something that we didn't cover because, you know, again, it's such a big topic and even just the diagnosis and testing and all of that is such a big topic. So we don't want to overwhelm people. We really just want to cover the things that we think are the most salient and important points. But if there's something that has been kind of on your mind that you've heard that you're confused about, we don't mind covering those topics at, at all. Yeah. So reach out because we're here for you and we will be talking about asthma for the next month. So get excited. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.